Whew, that was a lot. There are countless ways to live and die in the animal kingdom, but most of our attention is reserved for the lions, sharks, and snakes of the world. These are creatures whose dramatic displays of strength, speed, and stealthiness confront us with the fragility of life and the limitations of human abilities. But as captivating as it is to watch a leopard snatch a bird out of the air, the deadliest creatures on this planet are actually much smaller. I'm talking about insects, bugs, spiders, centipedes. If you've ever tried to kill a centipede and missed, then you know the feeling of just looking around and being like, hmm, I'm gonna miss living here. I should probably start a list of things I'm gonna need to burn this house down. Scientists estimate that there are 200 million insects for every human being. 200 million. There are 7.8 billion humans on the planet Earth. Among this horde of many, many alien looking, constantly fighting insects, there is one that is the most prolific, one that has dominated by orders of magnitude with gruesome and creative and fascinating methods of survival and procreation. One insect that all the other insects eventually answer to. It's called the parasitoid wasp, and it is the most underrated insect of all time. Parasitoid and wasp are two words I want absolutely nothing to do with, but here we are. In this episode, I'm going to tell you three stories about the parasitoid wasp and the unbelievable alien-like process they put other bugs through to complete their reproductive cycle. Before we even start to unpack what's going on with the parasitoid wasp, there's an important distinction that I need to make. Parasites live their entire lives on or inside a host. Parasitoids live most of their lives as independent creatures out in the big, beautiful world. But in order for them to reproduce, they have to lay their eggs on or inside a host. Just, I, I'm already in a bad place. Okay, now that we have those definitions out of the way, let's jump into the stories. The first one is about the roach which is a creature that's known for its ability to survive almost anything until it meets a wasp called Ampulex compressa, AKA the jewel wasp. This thing literally hunts cockroaches, which is weird for me because it's much smaller than the cockroach, but that does not matter. And cockroaches aren't calm creatures either. When they get scared or if they get flipped over, they're kicking and writhing and jumping and moving around. So when the jewel wasp, after carefully stalking a cockroach, finally grabs hold of it, it is in for a wrestling match. Watching insects fight is like watching robot wars. Anyway, the jewel wasp grapples, and I mean grapples with this cockroach, just so it can get in the right position to deliver two very specific stings. The first one goes into the thorax of the roach and it disables its front legs. Even with the front legs disabled, the roach is still kicking the rest of its legs and kind of trying to get away. But the second sting, that is the real decisive one because that one actually goes straight into the roach's head. Just follow me for a second. The wasp stings the roach in the head and through its stinger, it feels around and can find the control center, the cephalic ganglia, and injects it with a perfect amount of venom. And I mean the perfect amount because too little venom and the roach continues to fight. The wasp doesn't have an unlimited amount of energy. Too much venom and the roach dies. And one thing that you're gonna learn about the parasitoid wasp is that all of its victims need to stay alive. So what does this venom do? Great question. It causes the roach to become extremely submissive, which allows the roach to be easily manipulated. This type of drug-like behavioral manipulation is called hypokinesia. If you thought things were already bad for this roach, it's about to get so much worse. This wasp grabs the roach's antenna, tucks its head down, and then vibrates in such a way that its jaws act as buzz saws and it clips the roach's antenna at a very specific spot. Wrestling a cockroach and doing brain surgery takes a lot of energy. 
And once the antenna is clipped, this stuff starts dripping out of it called hemolymph. It's basically roach blood. So the wasp grabs the roach by the antenna and starts to drink the hemolymph using the antenna as a straw. I don't wanna hear anything else about lions waiting in the tall grass for gazelles. This is, this is where the scary stuff is at. The wasp can't carry the roach, it's way too big. But since the roach is subdued, it just takes the roach by the antenna and walks it like a dog into its burrow, like just a slightly stubborn puppy. Once it gets in there, it lays an egg on the roach's back leg and then leaves the burrow and buries the roach in there. Watching the wasp pick up little pieces of rock and soil and sticks to cover this hole like it's just a little construction worker is just insult to injury. Busy, it's just so busy. It's on site, it's on an on site project. The roach is still alive. Sawing off of the antenna, the drinking the hemolymph, the brain surgery, the now being buried alive, this is, the roach should be on that show called I Shouldn't Be Alive. It takes three days for the egg to hatch. And the first thing it does is it pricks the roach's back leg and starts to drink its hemolymph. As the larva is feeding on the roach, it secretes antimicrobial compounds to sanitize and preserve it. It's just, it's too good. At the second stage of development, this larva is like, Mm, this whole drinking hemolymph from the roach's leg thing is nice, but I kind of have a taste for something different. So it enters the roach's body cavity and starts to eat its internal organs. First of all, the thought alone of a grub with teeth, I can't do it. I cannot. Throughout every stage of development, this thing's teeth are just right to do the next worst thing. So when it's tiny, the teeth are little tiny little prickers that can prick a hole in the back of the roach's leg and let it drink the hemolymph. But by the end of the second stage of development, they're big enough to make a hole in the side of the roach's body so that it can literally enter the body of this still alive roach. The roach is still alive. I'm good. When the grub has had its fill, after it's eaten all the roach's internal organs, it spins a cocoon and then it breaks out of the cocoon after it's fully mature, emerges from the now husk of a roach, climbs out of the burrow and starts the cycle again. Number two is a creature that most of us think is really cute. It's the caterpillar. Caterpillars don't really bother anyone. They just walk around on stems, chew on leaves, just moving along on their journey to become moths or butterflies until they run into a wasp. This is a good time to tell you that the parasitoid wasp is really host specific. There isn't one wasp that just goes after all the caterpillars. There's one species of wasp for a particular species of caterpillar. So let's start off by thinking about the caterpillar of the cabbage white butterfly. Its saliva mixed with the vegetables actually creates a smell in the air that attracts parasitoid wasps. Wasp, another reason to chew with your mouth closed. These wasps stalk the caterpillar and wait for the perfect moment to pounce. A parasitoid wasp versus a caterpillar is a fight. If the wasp is successful, it lays a bunch of eggs inside the caterpillar and then it just flies off like nothing happened. To be fair, the caterpillar also carries on like nothing happened, eating radishes and cabbage like it doesn't have a bunch of alien grubs inside of it, feeding off of its body fluids. For two weeks, these alien babies grow inside the caterpillar and expertly avoid its non-essential organs. At the end of the two weeks, these alien wasp babies are ready to emerge. And lucky for them, they've got just the right set of teeth to do the job. First, they release a chemical that paralyzes the caterpillar and then they get to work. Nothing really prepares you for seeing a ton of wasp grubs chewing their way out of every free spot on a caterpillar's body. But if you've ever seen french fries being made from whole potatoes, that's kind of what it looks like. I'm still gonna eat french fries. I'm not even gonna hold you. Caterpillars that have been attacked by these wasps look like they're covered in little fuzzy cotton balls, except they're wasp babies that 
have been living inside of it. You would think that once they're all gone, Caterpillar's free to go, but it's not. The Caterpillar wasn't just infected by a ton of wasp eggs. It was also infected with a virus. And this virus turns it into kind of like a zombie babysitter. So you have an animal that would normally not display any sort of maternal behavior that starts to take care of this mass of cocoons. The caterpillar actually uses its own silk to spin an extra protective layer over the wasp cocoons. Once it's done spinning that extra protective layer, the caterpillar literally stays there, watching over this mass of wasp cocoons, flicking away anything that comes anywhere near it until it dies. It literally starves to death because it will not leave this mass of wasp cocoons that it just gave birth to. This is weird, right? There are levels. Mind you, I started this episode just to tell you a few of the ways that parasitoid wasps kill other insects when they get caught in the crosshairs of their reproductive cycle. I haven't even like gotten into the science of perhaps I'm not going to do that on this episode. We, we're going through a lot right now. You're probably thinking, okay, a cockroach, a caterpillar, not really animals known for their ability to defend themselves. But what about spiders? The big, hairy, lizard, mice, bird hunting spiders, those kind. Turns out there's a parasitoid wasp for that. They're called spider wasp. And their family has species of wasp that hunt tarantulas, wolf spiders, huntsman spiders and baboon spiders so spacex filled out the application waiting to hear back i just want a job shadow at spacex i just want to just i'll go for free to outer space spider wasp can grow around two inches which put them up there in size in comparison to other wasps but you have to remember they're going after huge fat meaty spiders. Tarantulas, for instance, measure upwards of four inches and their leg span can reach up to seven inches. So how does a two inch wasp hunt a four inch spider? There's a wasp called the tarantula hawk that is known to go after, you guessed it, tarantulas. Tarantulas live in their burrows for the most part. The only time they really leave their burrows is when it's mating season. The males leave those burrows to go find mates and when they do that they're really open to attack. Outside of the time when they leave the burrows the tarantula hawk has also been known to actually walk around the perimeter of the tarantula's burrow tapping and trying to lure it out. The species of spider wasp that hunts the really scary looking baboon spider doesn't even bother trying to lure the spider out. It just dives into its burrow and forces it out. Regardless of how they cross paths, once they start fighting, it is a real wrestling match. I mean, these spiders have really huge fangs. And so the wasp is trying to one, keep the spider's legs apart so that it doesn't swoop it into its fangs and avoid getting bitten while it's still trying to find a way to sting the spider in just the right spot. Spider wasps are known to have some of the most powerful stings in the insect world. And they need to because they're taking down these really big spiders. But these stings don't just affect bird hunting arachnids, they also are really painful to humans. There's this entomologist named Justin Schmidt that created the Sting Pain Index. He basically got stung by a bunch of insects and then ranked them according to how painful they were. A rating of zero means that the sting is completely ineffective. The common bee sting is ranked at a two, but the tarantula hawk is a solid four. And when I say solid, according to Justin Schmidt, the sting of the tarantula hawk is, and I quote, instantaneous, electrifying, and totally debilitating. It's not going to kill you, but it will last about five minutes. And in his expert opinion, the only thing that you can do if you're a person who's been stung by a tarantula hawk is to lay down and scream. So he is an entomologist. Thankfully, when they're not hunting tarantula, tarantula hawks are actually pretty docile, so they're unlikely to sting people unless they're extremely provoked. But back to the fighting. Once the spider's paralyzed, the wasp drags it back to its burrow 
in a scene that is perfect for a viral social media post. I mean, this is a tiny wasp dragging a giant, lifeless looking, paralyzed spider carcass to God knows where. And they drag them until they get to the perfect spot to bury them. So they dig a little hole in the ground and they drag the spider in there and they lay an egg on its abdomen. And you can guess what happens next. After a few days, the egg hatches, eats the spider from the inside out, climbs out of the spider, climbs out of the burrow and begins the cycle again. So there you have it. Three of the worst ways to die by parasitoid wasp. And let me be honest, those are three that I selected from what felt like an endless list of ways that insects die by parasitoid wasp. This insect preys on a wide range of hosts in really specialized ways, which leads me to wonder how many insects they specialize in and how many wasp there actually are. Join me on the next episode as I talk to some researchers about where the parasitoid wasp sits in the world of science and why so many people have never Never heard of them. I think there's too much news.